Hello, my name is John Charlesworth and I'm a historian and a heritage interpreter. And today I've come here to introduce you to my, what has become my backyard, which is uh, Cresswell Crags. I've worked here on and off for about 13 years and it actually is an incredibly important place as far as archaeology is concerned. It's uh, one of the, the oldest places that we can tra trace human activity to in this country, going back almost 60,000 years. And it is part of this amazing Welbeck estate, which belongs to uh, the Dukes of Portland. It still belongs to that estate today, and it lies on one of its edges. And um, it lies actually in an interesting uh, uh, sort of rock called Magnesian Limestone, which runs in a very narrow band up and down the middle of the country. It's a lovely sort of yellowish limestone. It's very important economically. And that is what um, this gorge is cut through. It runs actually up the Nottinghamshire Derbyshire border. This is the border because the cliffs in Cresswell Crags on this side are in Nottinghamshire and the cliffs on this side are in Derbyshire. And as you can see, it's got this lake in it. Now, um, that lake isn't original. It doesn't go all the way back to the Ice Age as most of our archaeology here does. It was only actually put here in the 19th century by the Dukes of Portland because they heard that at some stage somebody was going to put a railway line through this gorge so in order to prevent that from happening, or part of the process of pre preventing that from happening, is that they had this, uh, the river that passes through this gorge dammed and uh, held back the waters to make the lake. And that is supposed to be what stopped the railway line from being built and destroying our uh, lovely environment here. Now, one of the caves on this side, on the Nottinghamshire side, the first one that you can see, that is uh, uh, called Boathouse Cave. And that was flooded, that's where the, the Duke was able to uh, row his boats into. He made a little um, key on the left-hand side, made a concrete where he used to tie his boats up. So he was able to sail out or row out onto the lake here, pop off a few ducks for lunch, and then uh, sail back and tie his boat back up. So that's why it's called Boathouse Cave. Now, probably the most important thing about Cresswell Crags is the fact that it's an important Ice Age site. Archaeologically speaking, it's one of the most important in Britain, if not the most important. We've actually got about 24, 25 caves here uh, in this gorge, and nearly all of which we found Ice Age evidence. Evidence of uh, ancient animals such as uh, woolly rhino and mammoth, bison, reindeer, and also uh, of people having stayed here as well, leaving their tools behind and the art that they've left behind. Now this goes back at least 50,000 years to a time when Britain was a bit like Canada or Siberia now, a tundra-like environment. So uh, the ice and snow melted in the, in the summertime, grasses grew up, and that's what attracted the animals and the people that lived off them um, this far north into Europe. Of course, there were no trees here to speak of. It was too cold for them to grow all year round, so you'd quite easily be able to see the sides of the cliffs on this side, on the Derbyshire side. And we've got quite a number of caves down here. Our largest one is Robin Hood Cave, um, which is our only multi-chambered cave where some of the most important finds have been discovered. Even bits of art, which are all in the British Museum now, engraved on pieces of bone. Uh, now, the first people to get here weren't like you and me, they were our Neanderthal cousins. And we're just about the furthest north anywhere in the world that Neanderthal ac activity has been discovered. Um, they were here until about 40,000 years ago or when there was another plunge in the temperature and, and there's nothing living up here. And then when it gets, gets warmer again, um, a few uh, tens of thousands year, of years later on, uh, then modern humans, just like you and me, start to arrive here. But only living here during the summertime. Okay, so here we are outside uh, Church Hall. Now, this is one of the most significant caves that we've got here on site. We've had archaeologists working here now for about 140 years altogether, on and off. Uh, but in 2003, one of the most significant finds was found in this cave. And uh, that is uh, the discovery of cave art on our cave walls for the very first time in this country. It's uh, the most northerly cave art ever discovered anywhere from the Ice Age in the world. And it's about 13 to 13 and a half thousand years old, which makes it uh, just about the oldest art uh, ever discovered in this country. Once they found the art here, the team of, of archaeologists who made this fantastic discovery, for the first time in 30 years, got permission from English Heritage to do a year-on-year -year excavation here at Crestville Cracks. Because normally speaking, it's not allowed it being a, an ancient monument site, so you have to get special permission to do that. And they dug a trench uh, to the right of these um, steps here, uh, from the cliff 
face all the way down to uh, the, the pathway down here. To begin with, they were going through Victorian scree because the Victorians used really brutal methods to, put, to um, do their archaeology. And basically, anything they didn't like, they just threw away outside the cave. So each one of these caves has got a massive scree slope packed full of uh, archaeological material that the Victorians had completely overlooked. But one nice piece of evidence that we found once they'd got to, down to the intact archaeological sediment at the foot of the trench, very close to the footpath, is, is that they found in the actual place that they were dropped uh, some broken Neanderthal hand axes very close to the foot of the steps down here. Now they must have been dropped there about 50,000 years ago which is not only incredible but it's also um, a nice piece of evidence for us about the erosion of this limestone making the gorge because if they dropped that those there 50,000 years ago it means that this valley floor can't have been really any higher than we see today so as far as any human being of any sort modern human or neanderthal has seen this gorge it's always been about this size okay behind me now is Cresswell village and that is uh, a mining village. In the end of the 19th century, the Dukes of Portland obtained the mineral rights to be able to dig a very deep mine underneath our feet here to tap into the rich coal seams beneath us. Uh, you can see where the old mine was. Uh, it's immediately behind me. There's a green pitched roofed building that stands over what was the mine shaft. They were digging here from the late 19th century to the late 20th century. The mine is closed now. And um, there are a number of uh, streets within Cresswell itself which commemorate the attachment that the, the place has got to uh, Welbeck Abbey. There's Duchess Street and Duke Street, for instance. Not long after the, the mine began, um, the Duke wanted to develop a, a model way of living for uh, miners, an ideal way of living for them. And uh, as a result of that, the model village for which uh, Cresswell is quite well known around these parts was constructed. Uh, and it's very close to the old mine workings. To the right of, of the mine workings, as you can see over there, there's a large red roofed building. That's the miners' welfare. Beyond that, there's a double oval of grey roofed buildings and they are the miners cottages. Now here we are at the western end of Cresswell Crags Gorge and this was the site of a village at one time and as part of the improvements that the Duke wanted to make uh, to the gorge to turn it into this kind of fantasy landscape along with the lake he had the village moved uh, to where it is now, Cresswell village uh, where it is now. Now um, at the time when the village was here uh, there was a mill here and there's a, a, a mill race that passes underneath the bridge that we're, that we're standing on which carries the water of the river which fills the lake. Even now, uh, in the springtime, you can see plants in the, uh, the slopes of the gorge on either side which must have been the back gardens of the cottages that were here because there are ornamental plants in them, um, things like, uh, th things like uh, rhododendron, that kind of thing. It's either part of their their backyards or it could have been introduced by the gorge to make the place look a bit more exotic. You can still see evidence of them, uh, the, the villagers, using the caves as their back rooms or at least part of them. Um, outside Dog Hole, which is a cave at this end, um, at the bottom of it there's a sort of a, an archway which must have been part of a structure that belonged to one of the buildings. The village that used to exist at this end of the gorge was immortalised almost by chance by a very famous painter, George Stubbs, who is famous nowadays for painting racehorses. At the end of the 18th century, he was visiting uh, Welbeck Estates on the invitation of the family because they wanted him to paint their string of racehorses. And walking around the estate, he found Cresswell Crags, thought it was a tremendous romantic and rugged location and asked permission uh, from the family to be able to use it for his own paintings. So he produced a series of paintings depicting Cresswell Crags, one of which shows this village, but two uh, of the others are much more fantastical. Um, in it, he's exaggerated the uh, height of it, the cliffs, he's made the water rush a lot quicker, and uh, he's also put unusual images in it. For instance, there are pictures of Arabs uh, with Arabian horses here in the crags. And there's also one painting where he's depicted a lion attacking a horse. The irony of that is, is that this was 80 years earlier uh, than the first archaeological excavations 
here that took place which discovered that we actually had scenes like that happening here in the Ice Ages. Herds of horses were up here and so were things like cave lions and hyenas. So there would have been horses being attacked by lions um, 15, 20,000 years ago here um, at uh, Crestwell Crags. Now this is Pinhole. Uh, now you can't call it Pinhole Cave because the word hole uh, means cave in Old English, so I'd be calling it Pin Cave Cave if I did that. And uh, this is probably our most important um, cave as far as intact archaeology is concerned. The only half of the sediment that's available to be excavated has been excavated here, but even so, about 29,000 objects have already come out of this, this cave from the last ice age. But I brought you here really to talk about the legend that goes along with this uh, cave. These caves were given their names by the Victorians. Pinhole actually refers to a legend and a little bit of local folklore uh, which used to occur at this cave before um, the, the archaeologists arrived to do their excavations. In the days when ladies wore large hats and had a lot of hair, they used to have hat pins. So um, the story goes that if you were a young lady who wanted to find out who the person was that you were going to marry, you would come along to this cave with a hat pin, you'd walk into the cave, you'd drop it into a pool at the back of the cave which used to exist there before the Victorian archaeologists dragged the floor out. And um, you'd turn around after dropping the, the pin in there, come back to the cave entrance and the first lad that you saw walking past was the one that you were going to marry. So you better make sure that the one you fancied was nearby at the time. Now this is Robin Hood Cave and it, this is the largest cave that we've got here. It's our only properly multi-chambered cave and it's yielded some of the most important finds um, including um, things like um, Cresswell Points which was a particular sort of flint blade that uh, was first identified here at Cresswell Crag so it gets the name Cresswell and um, also pieces of Ice Age art engraved on pieces of bone which are now in the British Museum but it's also got an association with our famous legendary hero uh, Robin Hood now, uh, here at Crestwell Crags, we're still in what was the Royal Forest of Sherwood in the Middle Ages, still within its boundary, which was an area covered by forest law that protected the king's deer and the, the ground and the forest that the deer grazed on for his hunting purposes. And there were two stories here that are associated, associated with Robin Hood. The first one sounds quite simple. Uh, basically, what happens is, in this story, uh, Robin Hood has been uh, found in the centre of uh, Sherwood Forest. His encamp encampment has been discovered by the Sheriff of Nottingham, and the Sheriff begins to chase him out of the forest uh, towards the west. And Robin is chased through the gorge here, uh, and he sees that there are caves in which to hide, and he chooses one of the caves, this one, and he hides in this cave, and allows the, the Sheriff, who doesn't see him, go galloping off into the west, and uh, Robin's able to sneak back into the centre of Sherwood Forest. There's another t a story though, and this involves King John and Clipston Palace. Now, Clipston Palace is a real medieval palace, which the ruins of you can still see uh, at Clipston in Nottinghamshire, and it was favoured by a lot of the medieval kings. King John stayed there, so did Richard the Lionheart, and uh, King John's son, Henry III. And the story goes that King John is staying at Clipston Palace, he hears that Robin Hood and his men are hiding here at Cresswell Crags, so the king gets his men together, gallops up here to Cresswell Crags to surprise them. When he gets here, he discovers that Robin's not here. And it's just been a trick by Robin to get him away from Clipston Palace so that he can be back there releasing all the prisoners from King John's clutches from the dungeons. Now this is Mother Grundy's parlour, and this is a quite special cave because um, according to legend, this is where a witch used to live about 200 years ago, called Mother Grundy, obviously. Now, um, according to legend, yes, but she probably was a real person, uh, and she probably uh, lived with that community that used to exist in the village at the western end of the gorge. So it's highly likely that she's a real person, maybe one a, a local wise woman that's used to using uh, the local herbs uh, for producing medicines, that kind of thing, but got labelled as a witch. Now, um, these grills that you can see on a lot of our caves, they only went onto the front of the caves in the 1970s. So uh, nowadays, even now, uh, the older generations uh, locally can remember when they were 
uh, children playing in these caves. You get lots of graffiti inside these caves that have been left there by them in the past, about 100 years worth of it going back into the 19th century. And you do get stories from time to time about people saying, well, I went into a cave um, either on, when I was rambling around Welbeck Estate or when um, I was at Whitwell, which is another local village. I went into a cave in Whitwell and I was able to come out of one of the caves here at Cresswell Crags all the way through. That can't happen, unfortunately. None of these caves go very far back into the cliffside. No more than about 150 feet is our, lar our long, largest cave. Um, some not as, uh, as far as that. This one's quite a small cave. It only goes about 12 feet down a side passageway there and then it comes to an end. So those stories are nice, but they can't be true. I wonder whether it is actually harking back to tales of the tunnels under Welbeck and whether, and whether people have got those ideas of these extensive tunnels that were made by the fifth duke all, all over this estate and they've got those slightly confused with the caves here. But they're certainly not attached to the tunnels under Welbeck as we know them now. Thank you.